An article from an 1863 edition of Scientific American reads, Experts doubt the sun is actually burning coal. Now, historically speaking, this is fucking hilarious. But the weirdest word there by far is doubt, as in presumably some scientists were taking it seriously then? What the hell was going on? Well, it isn't that ridiculous, this is astronomy about 150 years ago, and if you haven't discovered nuclear fusion yet, and you're trying to work out what makes the sun go, well, the sun has been burning for ages, and what burns for ages on Earth? Coal does? Why not space coal? It was kinda reasonable at the time. Clever, clever, very clever, but wrong. Anyway, I filed that away in my 19th century megalols folder until recently I was sitting in the 21st century horsing into my fifth vodka and battery acid, reading some reviews of a book I was thinking about buying, and stumbled on a review that read, I do not believe in Einstein's relativity. Mikkelsen and Morley in 1887 showed that there is ether and that the Earth is the immovable center of the universe, but they just couldn't bring themselves to believe it, so a new ad hoc lying theory was invented by Einstein. There's also a good bit where the dude solves quantum mechanics, it was quite a ride. But I became fascinated by this review, partly because I'm a homebody with substance issues, but partly because what this reviewer was saying, in effect, was that 130 years ago, scientists actually discovered ether, the exact opposite of what Mikkelsen and Morley are remembered for, we'll get to it in a moment, and that Einstein messed up and physics has been wrong ever since. But there's something weird going on there, because clearly whoever wrote this knows about the experiments they've mentioned. They've read into all of it, they just have an alternate cosmology. And I thought, oh, this is clever wrong again, isn't it? Like the sun burning coal thing. Because to be fair, maybe we did screw up somewhere. Scientific paradigms have been flawed or incomplete plenty of times before. Many used to think that illness was caused by an imbalance of humours in the body, or that the earth is hollow on the inside, or a brief but robust debate in the 17th century over whether the rings of Saturn were in fact Jesus Christ's ascended foreskin. Ah yes, academics. Love them or that dental cavities are caused by teeny-weeny worms, or that vision came from rays emitted from the eyes, or that Mars had canals. Like, we didn't even know there were billions of other galaxies beyond the Milky Way, our galaxy, until about a hundred years ago. Considering how deluded we've been before, who are we to be so rigid in our models? How can we know the difference between a revolutionary idea that hasn't yet been accepted and just being deluded? Was Einstein full of shit? Well, in the 1800s, scientists were quite confused about how light can travel in space. Because sound waves propagate through air, through water, etc., they need a medium. But what medium can light from the sun be travelling through to reach us if space is a vacuum? Well, one theory at the time to explain this was luminiferous ether, a hypothetical medium out there in space that carries light. But how do you test the ether if you can't see it? Well, two scientists called Mikkelsen and Morley had a neat idea. So you get some light and a clever mirror that splits light in two and two more mirrors and a detector and the light beam is gonna brrr from here and the clever mirror is gonna split the light in two and the two new beams are gonna boing on the mirrors and travel back to meet up again here at the detector together and if this ether stuff exists, then because the Earth is moving through ether in one direction, one beam should travel slightly slower because it's being slowed relative to the direction of travel through the ether itself. And when you check the beams at the detector, you would expect a weird interference pattern because of the one delayed beam. But actually, well... Noops, ether was a clever idea, but wrong. Turns out light doesn't need a medium to travel in. There's a long and more interesting answer here about how sound is a mechanical wave, whereas electromagnetic waves don't need to piggyback on other matter, but essentially ether ain't a thing. Except the kind my great granddaddy used to huff, yeah! And not only did the Mikkelsen and Morley experiment kill the concept of ether, but more excitingly it implied that light travels at a constant speed in a vacuum regardless of the observer's frame of reference. Albert Einstein is only a wee nipper at the time, but in 20 years or so he's going to realise that's significant and turn it into a whole nother pipe of crack called special relativity. And he does that essentially with just two postulates. 1. No matter what speed two observers are travelling at, the laws of physics will behave identically for both of them. And 2. Ignoring 
acceleration, it doesn't matter how fast you're going, the speed of light will remain constant. It doesn't change relative to your speed, unlike sound waves or fired bullets. And as a result of that, we get time dilation, time travel essentially, length contraction, objects at relatively high speeds will appear contracted for watching observers, suddenly we know that mass and energy are expressions of the same thing, but most importantly, the usual three-dimensional Cartesian coordinate system gets an upgrade. When asking where you are, we need to know when too. Space, time, the water we swim in. And it wasn't Einstein's idea, it was Minkowski, one of Einstein's former teachers. Einstein wasn't even convinced space-time was a useful concept to begin with, doesn't matter. But what naturally comes next, ten years later, is general relativity, conceptualizing gravity as the curvature of space-time, which doesn't look like this, not really. As it's often put, matter tells space how to curve, and curved space tells matter how to move. All of this brought to us by the death of one clever wrong idea, ether, in favor of a clever right idea, space-time. And Einstein made endless blunders on the way there himself. He assumed the universe wasn't expanding, which it is. He was pretty convinced gravitational waves couldn't exist, which they do. He was the king of clever wrong. As Bertolt Brecht wrote, if some discoveries follow our predictions, we will look on them with particular distrust. And only when we have failed, when beaten and without hope we are reduced to licking our wounds, then, with iron in our souls, we will begin to ask ourselves if we might not be right after all. Uh, why are we talking about this? Oh yeah because light just carried on getting weirder and Einstein was wrong about a bunch more shit. So, for centuries before, no one was quite sure what light is. Newton thought light might be made of particles because it can be refracted in a prism and maybe the different colours are different types of particles. Then again, if you shine two beams of light across each other, just like the Michelson and Morley experiment, if light is made of particles, you'd think there'd be collisions, which there aren't, suggesting light is a wave. So which is it? Well, along comes this absolute unit again and explains something called the photoelectric effect, which is where, so you've got a metal plate and there's atoms in it and stuff, and if you shine a beam of light onto the plate, electrons in the plate are gonna boing, and you can detect them as they're ejected. Now, if we're of the opinion that light is a wave, you'd think you could just keep blasting the electrons with light and increasing the intensity, and eventually you pass a certain threshold and the electrons would dislodge. But actually, as it happens, electrons only dislodge if the light passes above a certain frequency, regardless of intensity or duration of exposure. Um, why? Well, it turns out that's because light is quantized, as in it travels as little discrete things, photons, not waves. So light is definitely made of particles. But it's also not, because sometimes it produces interference patterns, as we've discussed already. So is light a particle or a wave? And the physics community replied, yes. And so began quantum physics. We're going to need completely new mathematics to describe the wave-particle duality of matter. And what comes next are some pretty famous disagreements between Niels Bohr, another great physicist, and Einstein. The problem was that by then, quantum physics had become a statistical science. It works in probabilities, not least of all the uncertainty principle, one of the pillars of the quantum world. And what that says basically is the more precisely you measure the position of a particle, the less you know about its momentum and vice versa, which points to particles only being available to us before measurement as inherently probabilistic, meaning before measurement, Subatomic particles can be treated as being in all possible states, in a superposition. But when we measure them, we collapse the wave function of the particle and they become real definitive things. But what were they doing before we measured them? With this model, the causality of classical science goes out the window. And Einstein hated this. Surely the universe is deterministic, he thought. We can't just have randomness floating around. There must be hidden variables we don't know about determining what particles are doing prior to measurement. As he put it, God does not play dice. To which Bohr replied, Einstein, stop telling God what to do. But it's beginning to seem today as though God maybe does play dice. Each decade, quantum models of the subatomic just get more and more accurate. If there is some glaring deterministic hole, we ain't found it yet. Quantum theory works just as well if you assume the subatomic world is inherently probabilistic, weird as that may feel. Many today think Einstein was clinging to old classical ways of thinking, and that we've moved past such a paradigm. But in any case, as Brecht put it, the aim of science is not to open the door to infinite wisdom, but to set a limit to infinite error. Why are we talking about this? Oh yeah. 
Because by then, because of wondering about ether, because of clever wrong disagreements about what light and matter are, we have the two most powerful models of reality humans have ever possessed. Quantum mechanics, the science of the very small, and general relativity, explaining the interplay of matter and curved space. And for all the good they've done for cosmology and technology, they came together to make a monster. About a month after Einstein puts out his paper on general relativity, he receives a letter. It's sent by one Karl Schwarzschild, directly from the Russian front of World War I, and it contains a solution to Einstein's field equations, describing specifically how space-time would curve around a spherical body like a star. Today, we call it the Schwarzschild metric. But what the solution predicts is that if, say, a very large star ran out of fuel and, say, collapsed in on itself due to a lack of internal pressure, it would fall into such an extreme state of confinement, it would result in a point of infinite space-time curvature. Einstein would write a paper highly skeptical that these so-called singularities could ever really exist, but in actual fact, what Schwarzschild has just inadvertently discovered are black holes, and they do in fact very much exist. Today, we know even more to be freaked out about. For starters, black holes are not rare. The nearest to us is a mere 1500 light years away, Gaia BH1, and there are possibly 100 million in our galaxy alone, almost certainly formed by dying stars. A star just three times the mass of ours is all the mass needed to create a black hole. Then, of course, there's the supermassive variety, which can be upwards of billions of times the mass of our sun. There's a supermassive black hole at the heart of our galaxy, called Sagittarius A star, and probably one at the heart of every other large galaxy. And black hole is quite a misnomer, they're some of the brightest objects in the universe. As gas is pulled in by a black hole, it creates friction with all the other gas already orbiting it, called an accretion disk. Friction so intense it produces light bright enough to see thousands of light years away. Still, it's the inside of a black hole we really have to worry about. Because if you were insane enough to go near one, you would first find yourself inside the ISCO, the innermost stable circular orbit, which is exactly what it sounds like, the last toilet break before apocalypse. Next, you would approach the event horizon. From quantum mechanics, we know that in the normal universe, virtual particle-antiparticle pairs are constantly arising from the quantum vacuum, then annihilating each other. Near the event horizon of a black hole, though, occasionally one of these particles will enter the event horizon never to return, but its counterpart will manage to escape the black hole in a process known as Hawking radiation. Through this loss of energy, we can infer that black holes are not invincible. Billions of years though it may be, they do eventually evaporate. Operate. But nevertheless, crossing the event horizon, nothing would seem particularly strange to you at first. What's changed is that not only has it become impossible for you to send messages out, but to escape at all. With the escape velocity now equaling the speed of light, nothing leaves. Not light itself, not time. And here, everything begins to break down, including you shortly, thanks to tidal forces, in a process called spaghettification. That is, the gravity at your head is so much weaker than the gravity at your feet, you will be stretched out like enjoying a medieval torture rack. But assuming you stayed alive somehow, relativity tells us that space-time is soon to become so compacted, it results in a point of zero volume and infinite infinite density, the singularity. This is why nothing escapes, because there simply is no longer an out even geometrically possible. And as the death of dimensionality begins, time would become a spatial dimension, and directionally each path you tried to take out would only lead you further down towards the singularity. And in this way, black holes are not objects, but perfect absence. As relativity stands today, they are schisms in space-time itself, behemoths of infinite curvature, nullifying, inescapable, the points at which all the gaps in our modern theories converge. As Brecht wrote, in the dark times, will there also be singing? Yes, there will also be singing. About the dark times. Anyway, that can't be the full picture because we don't have a theory of quantum gravity yet. As in, we don't know how to describe gravity on a subatomic scale. Ask a physicist to calculate the gravitational field of an electron in superposition, and you'll either get a shrug or a kick up the arse. And until quantum mechanics and gravity kiss and make up, the inside of black holes are a mystery, as is much of the universe itself. Still, it's been a few months since I found that Amazon review. Obviously, whoever wrote it, I wish them well and hope something they love catches on fire. But the more I think about the thing, the part that irritates isn't the vandalization of thousands of scientists' careers, it's the sadness of missing out on a good story. 
Because last century physics had a very wiggly plot, and the main characters screwed up just as much as they succeeded, but it was a darn good yarn. And it's all very well to go back through the saga of science and try ripping out the Mikkelsen and Morley parts, but if you do that, then we don't get general relativity. Likewise, if you take out the photoelectric effect, then we don't get quantum mechanics. Any more than modern art would make sense without the Impressionists, any more than modern rap would without old dirty bastard. Hey, dirty. Baby, I got your money. What began with a question around a century ago about how light from the sun reaches us ended with discovering furious gravity abominations at the heart of more or less every large galaxy. The world turned out to work so differently to how we expected. It will doubtless keep doing this. And I don't know about you, but whenever I bump into this sort of um, reality fan fiction about the world being a little flatter than previously advertised or whatever else, okay, if you want to call out missteps in science, that's fine. But if you're trying to start a revolution, you will need revolutionary evidence. Because the idea of ether is just as weird as the modern concept of quantum fields, the fields pervading the entire universe, excitations of which give rise to particles. It's just that quantum fields currently have evidence going for them. That's it. The only difference between clever wrong and clever right is whether or not those hypotheses are confirmed by empirical evidence. Whether nature gives us a thumbs up or thumbs down and tells us whether it's true or not. Which is very different to just ripping pages out of the story because you want something to be true. That isn't clever wrong, that's just… you know. And maybe the bigger problem is that so much of what's turning out to look true these days doesn't have humans at the centre of it. I wonder if you've ever seen Saturn up a telescope. I did, around 10 years old or so. Now, I can confirm that there's no celestial foreskin waiting up there, but still, my initial reaction wasn't, wow, I just lost my shit for an hour and turned into a horrified, crying mess. Because to see it there, not just on a classroom wall or in a textbook, but actually there. To know it's enormous and it doesn't give the slightest damn about me. Where was I in that story? Not a fun moment, but children eventually get over themselves, of course, else they become YouTubers. And begrudgingly, I learned that I am relatively very miniature in the grand scheme of things, as we all do. And that was kind of nice, because what no one really tells you when you're little, when everything seems to revolve around you, is that one day, soon, you will stop being centre stage. You will grow up and meet many people who are smarter and funnier than you are. You will have to attend birthday parties that are not yours. But in return for that loss of centrality, you will get to set your own bedtime and drive, and accumulate a myriad of ever more damaging but exciting addictions. All the disadvantages of stepping back from being the main character are outweighed by the perks of becoming an adult. Is it the same with us as a species, maybe? Every moment of scientific integration, every step forward has told us the same thing over and over, which is that we are so much less special than we ever imagined, and yet so much more unique than we can even begin to understand. Natural selection demoted us from unprecedented standalone marvels to just very clever primates, but it also set us inside a multi-million year story of how lucky we were to get here, and how inextricably we're related to the rest of the animal kingdom. As humans, as organisms of the Earth, we really we are all one family. Astronomy demoted us from galactic centre to living in the cosmic suburbs, in a not particularly remarkable solar system, but also introduced us to a billion other galaxies, and revealed a scale of majesty and beauty our ancestors couldn't possibly have even begun to guess at. Told us that we are conscious extensions of the cosmos itself. You are nothing, you are everything. It's galactic gaslighting. But we could only have made those jumps, we could only have stepped into the new paradigms we occupy today by maintaining our humility. By remembering that we are still very young and we don't know how much we don't know yet. And as the generations go on, this might get worse. If we're to discover parallel branching universes alongside our own, or galactic civilizations that don't give a damn about us or whatever else, initially we will and try to spit it out for fear of being littled even more. But if nature points that way, then we must get our shoes and socks on and go for a wander over into the next unknown yonder, and it will be just as gorgeous and weird as the last ones we've found. So when one is confronted with strange modifications of the scientific story trying to reassert humanity back into the centre of everything, fine, but like, there's the other way. The corridor the empirical evidence is pointing down, where yes, truths are waiting that will sting our pride, but isn't a weird yes so much better than a comforting maybe? We are going on an adventure, don't you want to come? But there's only one rule, which is that you can't bring anything with you. No baggage about how special we are, no biases about how reality should work, and in this 
this way, we will inch closer to finding out what nature is even doing here in the first place. As Brecht probably wrote, I dislike you, review man. I bet you drive a 2004 Fiat Multipler, review man. I bet you say on accident rather than by accident. I bet you put sweet wrappers back in the box. There is no fundamental truth we will encounter in our future investigations that will be so horrific or strange, we will not be grateful we pushed on through the mist in order to attain it. That's what we do. That's what we've always done. As human as it gets. Fuck, I feel better. So glad we could share this moment together, you know? Now I'm going to go drink a whole load of whiskey sours and listen to James Brown. Oh no, I'm still angry. Well, I guess I'll just hold on to this grudge until I die. What a complete waste of my time and yours this has all been. I hate you. Goodbye.